Welcome everybody. Thank you all for attending the math success session for the summer 2021 term. My name is Nizi Morsera. I am the interim undergraduate advisor. Um, with me uh, is Dr. Sophie Burrell. She is a lecturer for the math department as well as Kaylin Pritchard and Matt Sprague, who are graduate students with us. So um, we're very fortunate to, today to extend our panel to Kaylin and Matt. And um, without further ado, I'll let Sophie get started. Thanks, Maisie. Good morning. No, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you find this um, helpful, and I think uh, I hope you really stick around um, at the end for a really valuable part where you'll get to um, talk to, with uh, Kaylin and Matt um, and myself <laughs> a little for any of your um, burning questions. Um, so this is our math success session um, put on by the Department of Mathematics. And before we get started, um, we just want to um, respectfully acknowledge that SFU um, and I'm coming to you from university right beside SFU. Um, it's on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam nations. So as an overview of what we're going to be doing today, we're going to talk about grades. What do they mean? Prerequisites. Um, and why they're important, <laughs> why we have them um, set up the way they are. Um, talk about a little bit about lecturing, um, note taking, this sort of business, um, homework, why in the world do you have to do homework, quizzes, exams, and then Maisie's going to take over for us and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, resources and policies. And I really do encourage you to ask questions. Um, I can kind of handle questions as they come, um, but if I can't, um, um, they will either be handled at the end or in the chat directly by Kaylin and Matt and Maisie. Okay. Um, yeah, so I am, I'm a lecturer in the department. I uh, had this job for three years. I am three years plus now. Um, I'm getting pretty good at um, knowing the ins and outs of, of success in a math course at our department. So um, grades and prerequisites. Math. We all love it. Oh, let me get us down a little bit more. <laughs> um, so all of you here are here probably because you need to take a math class or you're currently enrolled in a math class. Um, so on our left hand side here, um, we have um, sort of a description of, of some, some, some types of content, uh, some types of subjects, facts, space subjects, reading, memorization. Um, and then we have like more skills-based subjects and every single class that you'll ever take is somewhere on this spectrum, right? Um, between um, kind of memorizing things, um, doing a lot of reading, and then like practicing, um, identifying and applying all of these things. And, 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 where, and when every single class, not just math, will require, um, will require All right, that. so in our, um, for our purposes, you can't get away with not memorizing, absolutely not, right? Um, but we, but like, I, I like this comparison to language-based care, both based courses. There's a lot of stuff that has to, you have to learn a lot of terminology, um, but you have to really like apply it um, and practice it. And um, there's that old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. And um, that's not to say that you can't come back to it, um, but the more practicing and staying on top of it, um, um, the, the better, I guess. Um, the easier, the easier it gets as you go along. So, here is um, some of our math classes that kind of line up um, at, at SFU. So we have at the bottom of this tree. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Okay. At the bottom of the tree, we have Math 100. Um, this is pre-calculus wonderful course. Um, some of you will take pre-calculus, some of you will have credit for calculus, pre-calculus, um, and you will jump right into Math 150 or Math 151, uh, which is Calculus 1 or Calculus 1 with uh, review. Uh, 152, well that is 
calc two, two uh, math two five one, that's calc three. It's just really, really, really hard to succeed at calc two if you don't have your calculus one background. And so, the, so the, to, to again, go back to this analogy, success in French two demands language from French one in the same way that calculus two demands concepts and skills from calculus one. And so if you happen to find yourself in a in the position of, well, you know, like you, it's been a really long time or you like you've forgotten a lot of your pre-calculus knowledge um, and you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm currently enrolled in calculus. Like in some ways it's, it's it can be really worth it to, to go back and look at that, that pre-calculus knowledge. As someone who teaches Calc 1 a lot, um, I, I often have students who will say, well, I have the summer off and I'm gonna take Calc 2 in, in the fall. What should I do? Like if I wanna get ahead and not be overwhelmed by my calculus too. And my honest advice is like, make sure your calculus one is really good, right? Like make sure your calculus one is really good um, because you, like, it's really, really hard to build on a, a weak foundation, okay? And so um, getting those prerequisites down, like I, we, we, we will find students getting stumped by the, the, the prerequisite knowledge often um, in the upper level stuff. Um, and you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be getting like, you know, losing points in Calc 3 on pre-calculus material, okay? And it happens, it really, really does, okay? Um, so going back and reviewing your, pre, your, your prerequisite content is one of the most valuable things you can do. Grades, <laughs> why do we give them? Um, not just because we can. Um, the, the, they're really meant to be an indicator, like for you to know where we think, like how, how, how do we feel like you're, you, you, you did in this class? Like how, how, how is your, how much did you master this content? Um, an A, an A indicates that we have quite a bit of confidence in you. You've mastered the skills needed for the next class. You're probably gonna be okay, right? You can't just like not tune into your next class, okay? But like you, you've, you've, you've mastered your skills needed for the next class. Um, you've, 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 you've got a pretty good foundation, okay? Um, B, you, you may have some gaps, right? Um, you may have some gaps, but it's absolutely realistic that you can, you can move, you can move on for sure, right? A B is, is, is like, we were like, okay, yeah, like you learned a lot this semester. Um, you, you may have some gaps, but you know, nothing that you couldn't make up and catch up in the next semester. Um, C, C is a, C is a, is, is a, well, we're worried about you. You probably can do it, or you, you can do it maybe, but like, but we're worried about you. So yeah, indeed, if you've taken Calc 1, like you can, you can absolutely look ahead. Um, but the, the number one thing that I would urge you to do is really try to get your Calc 1 background. And like, you can also like go back and even look at your pre-calculus, like, like having a really good solid mastery of pre-calculus and Calculus 1 is really, really like, like you just wanna be really good at that. We do have a question from Annis. Okay. So if you've already taken Calc 1 and had the semester off, what would be the best way to prepare for Calc 2? Yeah, so uh, like, like facility with um, like your pre-calculus skills, like if someone says to you, like you need to go find the root of a number, like you want, you want to know what, what we're talking about here, like reviewing your terminology, like pre-calculus skills, calculus one skills are all really, really valuable because you have a really solid baseline in that because you've already taken those classes and you can go back and reviewing things a second time is very, is very, very helpful. Right, you can like kind of be very illuminating too. Trying to read ahead is not bad. It's absolutely not bad. It's it's just it's just a more ambitious thing. And I would I would honestly urge you to spend your time kind of mostly focusing on um, kind of revisiting older stuff. Maybe other people will jump in at, in the Q and A and say, or I don't know if you can jump in now, Matt or Kaylin. Um, like reading ahead is not bad. Like I urge you to do it. It's just trying to take on a whole semester worth of content. It's very overwhelming, and I I don't think of it as a particularly that's something I would do. And um, would you suggest to review all the materials from Calc 1 uh, for Calc 2, or are there specific parts that you would suggest to review? Oh, good question. Um, like, 
Yes, yeah, like like which are your weakest points? Like if you've taken this class, um, you've probably had a midterm or two or a handful of quizzes, um, and you can see where um, where things uh, where where your where your strengths and weaknesses were. Um, you 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 want to review your the parts that that, that you were weak, that you were weaker in. Okay, um, that's that's where you want to try to fill in those gaps. So let's talk about lectures and notes. So contrasting exactly with what I said, where like you don't want to read ahead before lecture in an individual class by class basis, you absolutely do. Okay, um, preparing for a handful of a handful of minutes, five minutes really, really, really valuable, okay? This took me way too long into my undergrad degree in order to do this, or uh, to, to kind of figure out how helpful this was. It's really helpful, okay? Going back, taking a look at what you did last class, previewing what's about to come. The, like, so like reviewing your class notes in advance, um, like saying like, oh, look, we're gonna be talking about integration by parts today. Um, like, you know, like, even just to know that that's an important phrase and to be able to key in on that when your professor speaks about that is saying like, okay, that's a thing I saw and that had a big bolded and it was highlighted and I can maybe pay a little more attention now. It's really, really helpful. Even just like, if you don't like actually learn things, but just kind of get a little bit of familiarity so that in class you're primed to learn that stuff. I don't know if that helps or not but really spending even a handful of minutes before class. Um, when we get back on, in, on campus together, you'll be waiting in the hall, right? Or you'll be sitting in class, um, waiting for your professor to start, taking a look at your notes. Like, also chat with people, because I haven't done that in a million years, but like also like, you know, scan your notes. It, it, it's actually really, it's a, it's a really helpful way of, um, it's, it's a good use of time. Don't just read. You want to be trying to identify exactly what the screen says. What does the new material depend on from before? What is the previous knowledge that's required? Okay. If you're finding that you are identifying the previous knowledge and you don't know that, that's 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 a, that's a key for you to go back and maybe try to to learn that stuff. Okay. We're always scaffolding on top of theirs ourselves here, and. Um, Fill in those holes and gaps as you move on. Otherwise, it gets really it gets really challenging. During your actual lecture, often but not always, in these first year classes, um, there are your professors have a set of partial notes. Uh, they're often PDFs where you they've maybe written a question down or they've written part of a definition in. And the idea is that instead of having you write everything, some of it's there and you kind of, it's like a skeleton notes maybe is a good word for it. Um, you can fill in and follow along or not. You could also try to record the key points, right? You don't want to be trying to capture every single thing that a person says. Um, you want to be getting the key ideas, okay? Um, During class, if you are, some of you are already doing this, you're asking questions. It's wonderful, 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 okay? Um, asking, I don't understand, is it can be challenging from someone in my position. It's like, okay, you don't understand. I don't know quite what you mean by that. The more specific you can be, the better, you know? When you went from step two to step three there, this negative turned into a positive. Was that the way it was supposed to be? Um, sometimes not, right? People make mistakes. Sometimes we do, we, we lose a negative. It really happens. Um, I'm sure you've seen it happen um, in your mathematical career, okay? Um, you know, ask, ask questions like, why, you know, why, 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 why are you, at, like, well, I don't have a good example, but like, but, but, but like, you know, trying to ask questions is really, really helpful. And like, it also like, as soon, like, like, it's just, from, from the instructor's point of view, it's like, you're showing that you're engaged with the material you're learning. You're not just sitting there. And it also helps us, like it's the, one of the hardest things about COVID is you're all black boxes, right? I don't even get to see your facial expressions anymore, right? I used to sit in a room with 200 students 
And if no one asked the question, I could at least look at them and everyone would be like, and I was like, okay, I think I maybe need to slow down and go back, right? And I found um, with, with the black boxes thing, like I, I've been lucky, I've had one or two students who kept their videos on all pandemic and that's really, 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 really helped me, okay? To kind of figure out what students are asking. But I also have, but I also find with the anonymity with the pandemic, students are a little quicker to ask questions in the chat, which is also very good. We want to get both those together, right? We want to be able to kind of respond in time, right? We're teaching your specific class and we want to be able to help you with your specific misconceptions, okay? So caveat, not all techniques work for all students. I'm telling you what works, for, what works in general. You always need to pick and choose what works for you, okay? Um, you may be somebody who never needs to take notes. Great. Um, chances are you are somebody who needs to take notes in some capacity, right? Um, you may be somebody who works really good bright and early in the morning at 4 a.m. That's what I do, right? Um, you may be somebody who likes to stay up until 4 a.m., okay? <laughs> That's other people, right? So everybody has their own style that works for them. Pay attention to your body and what is working. And, um, and you also will get some feedback in the form of your assessments. Um, is this working? Is this not working? Okay. Um, that's, that's our big, big caveat. Homework. <laughs> um, something you guys are good at. You haven't got anything they're really good at. I have hobbies these days. Here's the hobbies, right? Baking banana bread. I think that's what we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Is anyone good? I used to have hobbies. <laughs> I know I have a four-year-old. No, I, I will have hobbies again. Um, so I um because I have a four-year-old, I will use him as my as my touch point for this. He's like learning to walk. He's known how to walk for a couple years now, two or three years. Um, but but like he's not watch like he watches as I guess, but that's not nearly sufficient, right? He tries and makes these like when he's little, he took these like teeny tiny little ridiculous steps and he'd fall down, you try, get back up again, you try again. Okay. Some people play musical instruments. You, you, you have to practice, you have to practice, you have to practice, you have to practice in order to get good at this, right? Anyone gone for a run after never having gone for a run for <laughs> a few months? It's very painful at first, right? It's not very nice. You go, you're slow, it's labored breathing and stuff. And then you go out again, and you go out again, and you go out again, and you get, your body gets used to it. And you, and you get better at it. The, th this doesn't change with math class, okay? There's really, there is no shortcut to this stuff. You really, we don't have a magic wand for this. We have to practice. We have to practice, we have to practice, we have to practice. And that is where homework comes in. Homework is for you, okay? It's for you to practice solving the stuff you've learned in class. Many of you are probably in the calculus stream right now, and that means you're practicing calculus problems. When we give homework questions out, we've selected them because we think these are good questions for you to practice the stuff that you're learning in class with. It's not necessarily meant as a, if you do these, you are guaranteed to get an A plus. No, this is like, this is our, our subset of questions that we think are good for you. And, and like, it's underlined in yellow there. <laughs> Math is learned by you solving problems. If you're taking Calc 1 right now, um, or Calc 2, chances are you're watching somebody um, on video right? Um, teaching you a bunch of content, solving a bunch of problems. Ch there's a chance that it's me you're watching. 
I am really good at solving these problems because I've solved millions of them, right? I have put in so many hours in my life solving math problems. I have done many, 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 right? You can learn things from me. I hope you learn things from me or from the, whoever it is on the screen, right? I really, really, really hope you can learn things from me. Te te techniques, right? Strategies for solving problems. But 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 I'm I might make it look a little easy because I've seen the question over and over and over and over again, and we need to like I've I've logged my hours of frustration with calculus one. I logged them twenty years ago. Okay, <laughs> I the, like it, it, it. Everybody has the frustration and pushing through and doing the homework anyway for yourself. That is really, I can't underline how much you need to do the homework, right? You, not your brother, not your friend, not your tutor, or your TA. It, it really, 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 it has to be you, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah, we don't give it to you just for a grade. We're like, we're saying, here are a bunch of questions that we think dem like demonstrate what we uh, that will help you practice what we've learned in class. Um, so in italics at the bottom here, it says students are strongly encouraged to study at least nine hours per week for a three unit math class. There's some chance you're in a four unit math class. It's 12 hours in that case, so three units per credit, or three hours per credit, excuse me. Um, I um, Homework may not be enough to fill nine hours, right? Um, you should be doing the other things as well, reading, Practicing more, okay? The A plus students in your class, like you have classmates who are A plus students, they are practicing more than the homework, okay? Homework is an excellent place to start. It's a place to start. It is not the start and end of everything, okay? It is just the start. Does anyone have any questions about that? And again, I'm, I'll underline at least nine hours. Um, it's really, yeah. Yeah, uh, Senna's. Hi. Hi. For the homework, I usually do the assigned uh, questions. Mm -hmm. And if I want to do more, like to review for the exam, mm -hmm. I go and do them again. Mm -hmm. Should I do that or go and do another questions? Yeah, good question. Um, so I like, are, are you talking about like, Probably talking calculus, right? Of some sort? Yes, calculus, linear algebra, any math courses. Yeah, yeah. So 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 um those courses come with a textbook. Those text textbooks have a lot of problems in them. Um I would absolutely start with the assigned questions. Absolutely, hundred percent. Do those. Um then you can extend and start looking at other questions in your textbook. You should also return to them exactly as you mentioned, like returning to them. That's a really good way to kind of like solidify your understanding. Like you can do things um, a second time, okay? Um, like that's that's just very, very helpful to be able to like return to questions, do them a second time, do them a third time, do them, do them a 10th time. Um, but, but also like make use of like, especially like one of the big advantages of taking calculus is that Stuart book. There are so many questions in there, so many, and um, and and you can you can look at other ones like you're you know you're going to be assigned some even numbered questions. Go to some odd numbered questions. <laughs> it's like there's nothing dramatically different, but the odd ones come with really easy to find solutions. <laughs> That's usually um, uh, they're clear in the back of the book, I think. Um, but and, if there is not enough time to do every question twice, which one is better to do? Like do more question or do the questions twice? So I would I would go through the questions. So start by doing them once. Um, then I would go back and like, like if, if, if this was me, I would go back and do the questions that I had a really hard time with. I would do those ones again. If you struggle, if you were really, if you found some of them really easy, there's no use going back and doing those a second time. You want to return to the ones that you had trouble with, right? That you struggled with. Okay, so return to those ones, um, and then and then and then if you need to return to them again, return to them again, and and you know like and then for like the easier ones, maybe look for alternative versions of those questions, right? Like 
if they ask you to do question eight, just go do question seven, for example. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. If I may jump in here just for a second, Sophie. Um, one of the things that I find really useful when it comes to going over a question for the second time, rather than you know hiding my first piece of paper and writing it all out the same time, sometimes what I'll do is just talk myself through it verbally. Like, okay, first I'm going to do this thing and find that number by doing these three steps. And then I'm gonna do this. And if I can walk myself verbally through the strategy, I don't necessarily need to crunch all the numbers again to get the same quality of review. So I would really recommend that as well. And verbalizing it totally makes it interact with your brain a different way. So that can also be helpful for, uh, for cementing that. Yeah, that was really, it was a really good idea. Yeah, that verbal component, like trying to like articulate out loud, what am I trying to do here? Um, with And like removing all the like hard calculations um, from it and just sort of like, like taking a higher level look at it, like that can be, because like often it's really easy to get caught in the details of like, oh my goodness, I have to like do so, yeah, so much, so many calculations, right? But like, but if you can kind of like get that higher level, then you're going to be able to apply that to lots of questions if you have that higher level of problem solving going on. That, that's also why it's, it's often very useful to study with another person, I would mm -hmm. say as well. And then you're articulating to someone else who, you know, will give you a, a face of confusion if you're not making any sense or will recognize when you are making sense. Totally. Um, yeah, so why is homework assigned? It reinforces key concepts, provides practice for understanding concepts, and prepares you for the quizzes and exams, which we will get to before I'm done here. <laughs> um, so I do uh, wanna spend a moment here talking about um, types of problems. So, um, kind of for these purposes, we've got we've kind of broken them down into five different types of problems. Um, those that are testing memorization. Personally, in the pandemic, I have removed those questions from my timed assessments. Right? You can look them up. I've just removed them. Um, it's memorization is just sort of a weird thing that I feel like I can't really test right now. Not all of my colleagues have decided to do that. Um, you may have tests where memorization is possible when we get back to in person, absolutely there. Testing skills, that's your, go take a bunch of derivatives on this page, right? Um, problems requiring applications of skills that are to familiar situations, right? Like you've seen this, you've done a bunch of um, homework questions like that. And then four is this problems requiring application of skills to unfamiliar situations. So this could be harder, right? Unfamiliar situations. And you really like at higher level of kind of like exactly as Caitlin was describing, being able to talk out like, this is what I would do and this is what I would do and this is what I would do to solve it and then actually applying it um, is really needed there. So, um, and then five, even further requiring you to extend the skill whew, to an unfamiliar situation. That's challenging, right? That's challenging. Um, in our university classes, we will absolutely like, well, outside of a pandemic, we include steps one, parts, questions one, two, and three. They're there, maybe one not in a pandemic, but like two and three are definitely there. We also just include four and five, okay? Um, it's tricky, right? There's the word unfamiliar appearing in both of them. Um, but the more solid your baseline is, uh, the more solid your background is in kind of like really mastering all the content, they're accessible. They're absolutely accessible. Um, it, it's just being able to realize that you do have all of the skills there to do it. And I'll spend my last bit of time talking about quizzes and exams. So um, quizzes. We have um, in most of our classes, not all of them, um, but in most of our classes, you'll be quizzed, okay? Um, you can think of these as practice tests. They tend to be very low stakes, um, like one, maybe 2% each. Um, and they run quite frequently, often once a week, sometimes every two weeks, it really depends on the context of the class. Um, but, but they're really meant to be this frequent familiar check-in on how are you doing with the content that we just kind of went over? Um, and it's your first time of seeing how your professor kind of assessed this type of thing. They're 
a record of the work that you have done, uh, their record of what you've done correctly. And so maybe you don't need to work on so much. Um, but if you found yourself, wow, I just really tanked that quiz, that's meant to be an indication that alert, 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 you don't, you didn't master this content enough. And chances are you'll see it again on a more higher stakes assessment. And you should probably focus on that. Okay. Um, and the word your is there in capital letters three times. It's, it's, it's you. It's you. You're doing your work, your writing, your thought process. We're not going to get into academic integrity here, but it should be you. Okay. <laughs> um, they are low stakes, right? 1%, 2%. Um, the, uh, occasionally students will just say, well, it's not worth my time. It's really inadvisable from my perspective. We want you to take your quizzes seriously. Um, this is data from when we first started, my understanding is, um, so it, before quizzes, there used to be homework. And we found that homework was really uncorrelated to the students' final, um, final standing in the class on their final exam. Quizzes is not the case. Um, if you are mastering the quizzes week in and week out, it's a much, like, like this is pretty typical of what we see. Um, so like your quiz average uh, along our um, x-axis, our horizontal axis, and then their final exam score um on uh on our y-axis our vertical axis and, and like and like there's there's a fairly strong correlation here and you know we got these folks who scored you know with an average of one ish they are not passing the course right they're not passing the course and it, it's whereas those who you know, they got their eighth cell along. There's a big cluster of them up here in the 80 and 90th percentile in their final exam. And so, like, we, we like taking the quizzes seriously, it's just it's like we're, 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 we're giving you an opportunity to learn, um, to, 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 to get assessed with low stakes. Um, how much have you mastered the content that we've just done? And it also, is helping you kind of like stay on top of actually learning the content as you go along. Math classes move along quickly, right? They move along very quickly and staying on top of it is a big part of succeeding in math class, okay? And quizzes help you, if you can stay on top of the quizzes, you're probably staying on top of the course in a really good way. Uh, here's another one. A um, little less correlation. We have someone who looks like they didn't take any quizzes down here <laughs> who did um, really well. There are outliers to everything, right? Exceptions make the rule. There's a lot less correlation here with this 251. Um, but nevertheless, I really, really cannot help but recommend take your quizzes seriously. If you can stay on top of your quizzes, you're staying on top of your course. Oh, address this question, which um, comes up a lot in the first two or three weeks of class. How much do I need to show? <laughs> Did I show enough work? And until you've actually handed in a couple of assignments or quizzes, um, you may feel a little uncertain about this. Um, the standard really should be, can somebody else in my class understand what's going on with my solution? Okay. Um, like you want to be able to you want your work to be handed to a random classmate and they're like, yep, I understand what's going on here. As opposed to them having to like turn their head and say, oh yeah, I suppose if they move this to the other side and then, okay, maybe they did this. Like we don't want to have to guess. We want to be able to read your solution and just understand what you've done. Okay. We just want to be able to read it. Um, with that in mind, something that is not on the slide. Please add words. <laughs> Please add words to your solutions. I know people uh, tend to think of math as just numbers and symbols. We really like words. You actually read it, right? Like you want to read your solution. Um, the more words, like, you know, they don't need to, I don't need to essay, but saying like, because I know this, and then you can put an equation in, which tells me, and then you put an equation in, okay? 
just add some words in, make it easier for your, um, for your marker to understand what's going on. If you find that you've had to scratch something out and write something in a sound place, like put a little arrow, say, rest of my solution is here, okay? Um, just make it easier for your grader, your marker, your TA, your instructor, to find your work, to read your work, okay? It's really, yeah. So Kaylin has a comment in here, math solutions are communication, just like any piece of writing, okay? Take that very seriously. The more like, like there's a lot that, like even just like words like and, <laughs> really helpful, okay? Add in words, okay? Add in words. Um, and um, so like you want someone to be able to understand your thought process. That is kind of the, the main, the main thing that I'm trying to get at across here, like add in some words, add in some arrows, make a diagram, make a table, whatever, like, but just make it so that it's readable. We need to be able to see what you've done. Okay. We don't have to be guessing. Um, and then I think this is the last one for me, which is um, final exams. Um, usually, 50%, sometimes as low as maybe 30%. Um, but they're they're worth a bunch, right? They are held in the exam period. We have no say in this. One of my classes in the spring term had an exam on Sunday night at seven o'clock. I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't choose it. <laughs> I, was, I don't have any choice in the matter. Um, it's, it's really, this is, determined by the university. Um, math classes tend to be at the beginning. Um, no guarantee about that. You have to wait for the exam schedule to come out. Um, with some exceptions, exams are cumulative, okay? So although you may wish to leave everything behind from, you know, before midterm two, final exams are about the whole course. Um, sometimes there's an emphasis on stuff after midterm two, because we haven't assessed you on a major assessment on that stuff yet. Um, but they, they typically are cumulative with, with very few exceptions. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really want to belabor them too much. I feel like in the pandemic, they're so, so different from what they were when we used to all be in a gym together in rows marching around. Um, and I think I will turn it over to Maisie. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Burl for, um, going over the first two thirds of the slides. Um, it's super informative and I'm sure a lot of people found it insightful. Um, I will be go over, going over the resources and policies um, really quickly, boring stuff, but you still need to know. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, <laughs> Sophie. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Oh, that, thank you. Um, so basically, we will reiterate, there are resources available to you. Um, like we have wonderful people like Matt and Kaylin who, you know, who are part of the workshop, um, attend the workshops, especially when it starts back up in September. Um, you know, it's a hub for people to just go there to ask questions, you know, right now it's a bit more um, structured for, um, because it's on Canvas, but um, attend where you can and um, find those practice, those sample final uh, exam and midterm questions on the website as well. Uh, those are really, really useful. Those will go add to that practice of going over problem sets over and over again. Um, if you need to find a tutor, go ahead, but make sure once again, it's you're putting the work in. You're not just sitting there listening to a tutor. You're, you still have to put in the work of understanding the concepts um, they're gonna like go over with you. Um, and once again, it, it, it's really effective to have a study group. I know right now with online learning, it's a lot more difficult, but you know, there, the MSU has a Discord channel. Um, you could probably join in and find um, some study group partners that you could pair up with. Um, and, you know, you're just more effective when you teach each other um, certain uh, concepts and principles. Um, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, additional resources, I did go over the workshop page, definitely check it out. 
Um, and the, the Faculty of Science has the science peer tutoring groups. So definitely use those resources to your advantage. Um, these are undergrad students, probably in their third, fourth, fifth year who are teaching tutoring um, first and second year students on various math and other science courses. So definitely check them out. Um, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, on the library website, they have the Student Learning Commons, the SLC. Uh, once again, a great resource, not only just for quantitative courses, but also for writing courses, as you can see. Um, if you scroll down further, there's a specific math resource page. So you could take a look and you could see all the different links that they have and you could just read to your heart content. But of course, it's you can read as much as you want, but if you take notes from these resources, if you if there's problem sets here, definitely um, use those to your advantage again. Um, next slide. Um, and once along with the math page, they also have the quantitative resource page. So just to help in quantitative, quantitative courses in general. Um, and next slide. Um, there is also a textbook that's available that you could borrow from the library. I heard it's also available digitally. And um, if you want to better your understanding on how to study as a math major, I do recommend this book. Um, next slide. And deadlines is super important as especially coming from my advising point of view. Um, deadlines, they change every term. Oh, bookmark, please bookmark the deadlines page. Essentially, it'll outline when the enrollment period is, when an open enrollment starts, when, um, when the withdrawal dates are, when you have to apply for graduation. These are all on this deadlines page and they're final. Um, basically, uh, student services will not budge from the deadline set. So the elective grade system will also be on here. So once again, these are firm deadlines. So if you, if you accidentally um, missed the withdrawal deadline, unfortunately, it would be too late. Um, next slide. And of course, know your student policies. Um, they're located on the calendar. Uh, formally, you are only allowed five repeats of courses um, for your entire undergraduate career. Um, they have extended it to eight only for the COVID period. So um, if you have taken a course during, um, repeated it or taken it repeating the course after the COVID period, this will all count towards your eight repeats. Um, but after, once it returns to face-to-face -face in fall, everything will um, go back to five. Um, note that we do have equivalent courses. So Math 150, 151, 154, and 157, even though they're, they have different applications, one of them has a review component, they're still all considered calculus one, and they're all they're interchangeable in a in a sense, where they would count as repeats for each other. Uh, yes. So um, the question is, do you mean repeat in a case of failing? Um, it's either in a case of failing or your grade is too low to make the prerequisite for another course. So um, I know some courses, like say Calc two, might require a C minus or better um, for your Calc 1 courses. If you got a D, that wouldn't be sufficient. So um, you may need to repeat. So have a second attempt at redoing that course. Yeah, next slide, Sophie. Thank you. And this is the last slide. Um, this is my contact information. Uh, I, I will be moving offices in the, I think in the fall. In the, into the AQ, but um, I am, once again, the interim acting uh, undergrad advisor. Um, Bryant uh, will be back in August, but you, you can still reach me at the same email address at math underscore advice at sfu.ca and um, on the website is also available for you to access. And yeah, that's it for the presentation portion. We can now move 
on to the panel. Um, Dr. Burl will still be joining us for the first part, but it'll be mainly with Kaylin and Matt. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the chat earlier, and I did prepare a couple beforehand. Um, so throwing out to, to the three of you, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your first year self um, on how to study for quantitative courses? Um, I think the most useful bit of advice that I could give my former self would be, is really some advice that I wish I had at the time. And it's stuff that, uh, Sophie, you, you touched on even in this, in this presentation, but I want to, uh, emphasize making use of office hours with not only TAs, but your professors, which sounds like maybe it's an obvious thing, maybe that's an easy thing, but in my experience, actually going and making use of the office hours is one of the most tricky things to navigate when you're actually taking, you know, three, four or five courses at a time and you, you have split focus, it can often be really hard to actually formulate concrete questions that you think are ones that, uh, one of the problems that I had was I, I might have questions, but then I would think, oh, you know, that's not a good enough question that I can go to the office hour. And maybe if I go and ask that, then the, the professor might see that, oh, I'm not keeping up with the material. Why shouldn't I have known this weeks ago? But I've never experienced a professor who has had that opinion about any questions that I've raised in office hours or in class or anything. So I highly encourage you to, if you have questions, just go and trust that, you know, it's better to ask the question, even if you should have known it weeks ago, it's still better to ask and the professor or the, the TA um, will be happy to, to answer that question. Better late than never, I, I guess. Um, and the other tricky thing is sometimes what it takes to actually come up with questions uh, is going through after the lecture and reviewing your notes. Um, because sometimes, and especially during the, the lecture, um, your, your whole brain is basically going on the piece of paper. You're just trying to keep up with the lecture and copy down your notes. Um, and it can be hard to come up with questions in lecture. And that's another reason why it's good. And Sophie, you mentioned this to look at the lecture material beforehand. And then you can come up with questions to ask in lecture, but also reviewing your notes afterwards. And even if you look at them and you think, oh, I might've made a typo here. Like, you know, you look back when you're studying for exams and you just don't remember um, if that's a typo or if that's, you know, some mistake. So reviewing your, your notes after class can really help, uh, help you come up with questions and feel confident about your questions when you're going to the office hour. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, Kaylin, Sophie, do you have any additions to that? Yeah. Um, so I want to start off by saying that I very much agree with Matt. That's a great idea. Um, but I want to expand and broaden some of the things that, uh, that they were saying. So yes, absolutely go to office hours. Office hours is a great resource and use all of your resources. I think quite often, you know, first and second year students in particular have a tendency to underestimate just how many resources they have available to them. There are office hours, there are workshops, there are peer tutoring, there are, I mean, SFU is a wonderful, large institution with so many incredible resources that they're able to offer. I mean, your classmates are also a resource, like your textbook is a resource. You have, you know, Khan Academy videos are a resource. There are so many resources available to you 
not to mention all of the mental health resources and that sort of thing, because we can pretend that that's not part of studying, but the reality is if you don't have that stability within yourself, you're not gonna be able to make very much progress on your mathematics. So know your resources, use your resources. If you don't know what your resources are, if you're needing something and you don't know where to find it or what's available to you, talk to, talk to an advisor, talk to your professor, talk to your TA, talk to your classmates. Like there are tons and tons of different ways to find the support that you need. If office hours is good and that works for you, fabulous. If that's scary as heck, don't let that stop you from asking your question. Find somewhere else that you can direct that. Find somewhere else that you can mine that information. Um, there's just, there's so much out there. And I think that people have a tendency to really underestimate that. And I know I've seen people do it in the courses I TA for. I know I did it myself as a first year. Um, so please, please, you know, know your resources. And if you don't know them, that's totally fine, but be open to looking, really pay attention and, uh, and ask where you can find those things because there's so much out there. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'll, um, maybe I'll advertise our workshops at this juncture a little bit. Um, <laughs> like to go back from the big scope to the really narrow scope. Um, we're, we're supposed to be back in person in the fall. And if not in the fall, then surely the spring. Um, I expect that you'll all be back in person. Um, our, our workshops are, are really wonderful and they're also really underused. Um, I first did graduate school here a long time ago. <laughs> and, um, um, and, and the workshops were really hopping. Like there were these like great big rooms and they have these great big round tables. And students just go and they park themselves there. Like they just go, they sit, they park themselves there. It seems ridiculous to think about now in our current climate, but we'll get back there, right? And they would park themselves there and they would work on their homework, work on their study, review, whatever. And then they have a question in the moment and there is a TA right there, right? There's a TA right there to be able to ask their question. And if the TA happens to be helping somebody else, there's a classmate right there, right? And it, it like, it, they're just wonderful. And in their current incarnation, they're also really good. Like it's a little bit funnier because you're like in a Zoom room and you, maybe you're like overseeing somebody doing something else, but that's also really helpful. Um, if you find yourself really pressed for time, my word of advice that I give to every student who says, I have five courses and a full-time job and six cats to manage, I say, okay, um, how much have you been to the workshop? And I, and I like, and they're like, well, I've never been. I was like, okay, well go when, like, if you're going to, if you don't have the time to put into this course that's required, the most efficient thing you can do is do all of your work in the workshop, right? Um, and like, like I have had workshop hours where like I am the, I am the helper and I go in and someone comes in and they say, I'm just here to work and watch. And they like turn off their video and they turn off their microphone and I, they don't really talk to me. And I'm like, okay. But then some, but then like 20 minutes later, they're like, okay, so I'm working on this question and I have, and I'm like, great, right? That's kind of what, what I want to see happen. I don't know if that's always happening in a, like that might be particular to me, but I have had students do that, right? And that's what we wanna see happening more and more, right? Um, it will really depend on your particular, the models are all kind of over the place. <laughs> I don't really wanna to expand too much, but, but like this idea of being able to like, get help immediately. Like you wanna keep working on things, but if you've like been working on a question for like three hours, it's time to get help, right? It's time to try another strategy. We actually have a workshop uh, question. Um, oh yeah, Sorry, for talk to yeah. the workshop that we're assigned to is basically an office hour with the TAs to ask questions. Um, yeah, so like I'm talking about when I was teaching FAN, <laughs> which is not, I haven't even touched on at all here. Um, it's a it's a class that's before Math 100. Yeah. Um, it, it will depend on who's in charge of your particular workshop and how they're managing it. I don't quite know. Um, if at some of the bigger workshops, it might be different. I really don't quite know. But like when we get back in person, that's what the model is. It's like you go to work. Oh no, and we're losing. Like you're very welcome to come in with a really great thing about the this this model is your professors are in the workshop. Am I lost? No, you're you're back. You're back. Okay. 
Okay. So like your professors are in the workshop. So you don't have to actually go down that long corridor and like figure out what room, what, what tiny little office they're in and go into their space. You're in this really neutral space and um, there's way more t students than there are instructors. And I just think it's better. Um, oh, anyway. Thank you so much. So like for your valuable insight, we really appreciate it. And we'll continue this um, portion of the Q&A discussion. So please don't go anywhere if you're available, um, hang in there. And thank you again so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. See you later. Good luck in all your courses, folks. Um, so basically we'll start with the second question. Um, what, how would you prioritize your studying techniques? Um, would you focus more on reviewing notes or practicing problem sets or, um, Matt and um, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure if my studying techniques ne necessarily work for the majority. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and I never really liked writing exams. I always found them very stressful and especially studying. I didn't know, I never really knew what to study. Um, but what I'll say is this, uh, I always found the, the thing that always sort of put my mind at ease the most before walking into exam is when I went through basically all of my lecture notes and I didn't just rewrite them and like word for word, I tried to just summarize each of the, I, I kind of broke down the course into what I thought might've been the key takeaways, each of the big ideas. And there could be many, you know, there could be like 20, 25, who knows. Um, and just give a summary of whatever the technique here, general principle, general idea. Um, and after I, I did that for the whole course, I kind of felt like, okay, this stuff, I do know this stuff. Um, it's not so unfamiliar. And Definitely at that point, then I felt the most comfortable with jumping into practice problems. And I felt like, oh, I don't have to keep going back to and flipping through all my pages of messy notes. I have this, this shorter document where I can, I, that can basically support me through the rest of my studying. Um, I think mainly that was usually my strategy, yeah. That's great. Thanks so much, Matt. And don't underestimate, don't um, undersell yourself because what works for you, even though it might be um, different, it might actually click and resonate with someone else. So thank you. Um, Kaylin? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I actually, ha I have a similar technique to Matt, um, but instead of doing it you know, at the end of the semester and looking through and trying to create the key points, I would do it as part of like reviewing one class prior to the next class. And I would go through the previous set of lecture notes and identify, you know, key theorems or big ideas and that sort of thing. And over the course of the semester, compile very gradually this document of, uh, of those really, really key points. And like I mentioned earlier, I also would go through past homework and just verbally walk myself through how I would go about redoing the questions because I knew I didn't have time to actually redo all of the questions, but I did have time to think through how I would go about solving all of the questions. And that then at the very least, you know, caught my attention when I really noticed that I didn't know how to solve a particular kind of problem. And then I could go back and look in more detail. But if I already knew it and I could say, oh yeah, no, I would do this and I'd crunch that and I'd, yep, check, check. Okay, no, I'm good. Um, so that was how I checked over for myself. That's, um, yeah, that's definitely a good, a good thing to do. If you have the time to do that, that's probably the recommended thing for me as well. I just always found that for myself, I maybe I just lacked the motivation during the term or the time, I don't know. But um, yeah, if you have the time and the will to do that, then definitely that's very helpful. Great, thank you so much, Kaylin. Um, so from the chat earlier, I am sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, Ikam, uh, he said that, or he or she said that I am a computer science major with a minor in math. Will I be able to go to grad school for a math degree? And because you two are grad students, I thought it would be a great opportunity 
to sh show that even though you end up in the same spot, your path to get to where you are now is quite different. Yes. Uh, maybe Kaylin, if you want to start. Yeah, I can kick us off. Um, so my path to being um, a graduate student in mathematics is a fairly unconventional one. So I did my bachelor's degree in liberal arts and sciences at Quest University Canada. I went to a small bachelor's degree only liberal arts school, did a four year degree, and then I came to SFU for my grad studies. And I'm currently studying the history of mathematics, but I am in the mathematics department. I have all the exact same requirements as any other mathematics graduate student. Uh, the only difference is that my thesis will be on the historical development of trigonometry in the 1500s. And I don't think anyone else is, well, um, but you know, theses are like fingerprints anyways, everyone's is a little bit different. So I would say that, I mean, as a computer science student to do a mathematics degree, I don't think you should have any issues at all. I don't work in admissions. I can't, you know, say with clarity that you will most certainly get in, um, but it does not seem to me to be outside of the realm of possibility. Um, my undergraduate degree really only contained two years of focused mathematics courses. Um, so I imagine that a computer science student would have at least as much math background as I did. Um, really, you just need to be prepared to work hard. And if you have any missing background, be prepared to you know, find that prerequisite knowledge for yourself and fill in those gaps and use your resources so that you can get where it is that you need to go and stay caught up in your classes. Because once you're a graduate student, no one is going to hold your hand and do it for you. You have to be ready to take responsibility for yourself. But if you're willing to do that, your background can be flexible to a certain extent. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, especially, I mean, like you mentioned, when you're in graduate school, if you're doing a thesis rather than a course-based um, master's, for example, your thesis is kind of like your fingerprint. It's like a math problem that kind of suits you the best and that you find interesting. Uh, maybe no one else in the department would find that interesting, but if you find it interesting, then it's definitely worth doing, I think. And you're going if you're going through a computer science degree, for example, um, one, you have to take a lot of pretty pure mathematics courses, especially if you're doing a math minor. Um, but there's lots of just math problems that come along with doing computer science. There's no way around it. And if you really latch on to some problem that you come across that's mathematics, then it's likely you can go and you could do a master's, you do a PhD trying to answer that question. Um, another thing too is a lot of the theoretical computer science, depending on the university, sometimes it will fall in the computer science um, faculty and sometimes it will fall in mathematical sciences, for example, um, or maybe even engineering potentially. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you can probably do any of those things if, you, if you're doing computer science and you find that you're really interested in math. Machine learning is a great example. Um, there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, mathematicians right now who are um, working on developing uh, new techniques, which are basically just mathematical techniques. Um, and those people will be in math, math departments. Sometimes they'll be in computer science departments. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're interested in studying math, um, no matter what the, the faculty that you, you end up in, it doesn't really matter. There's plenty of people in computer science who are studying math. There are plenty of people in physics who are just studying math when it, you, or I mean, when you really look at what they're doing, it may as well just be math. Um, under the cover of some physics problem. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't think, uh, even biology, I mean, there's mathematical biology, right? Um, so you can basically study anything in your undergrad. And if you just have a strong interest and passion, then I don't think you'll have too much trouble going in to do uh, graduate studies in mathematics or just 
answer some mathematical type question. And and one thing I want to point out is that our um, across all universities, not just SFU, um, a lot of undergraduate um, programs are siloed. They're put in like specific um, disciplines. But in fact, uh, when you go out into the real world or uh, pr proceed in more academia, um, things are interdisciplinary. Things melt with each other. They have different applications and really like think outside the box. And the more you do and the more you apply your skill sets to different um, things, I feel like you would be more creative. You're flexing different muscles and um, you would stand out a bit better. Um, speaking of which, uh, I think this question, even though it doesn't sound like it's related, uh, is related. I am currently a Calc 1 student. I am fairly certain that Calc 2 is the last math class I will ever take. Do you think I should keep my math skills sharp despite the lack of usage in my possible career? And if so, how? I love this question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is something that we interact with and think about a lot, you know, as math majors or not, right? In high school, who hasn't heard it asked a thousand times, but when am I going to use this in my real life? And thus, why does it matter? Um, so Fazal, I would say, yes, it is important to keep your math skills sharp. And more specifically than your math skills, it's important to keep your numeracy skills sharp. So I think we're in the midst of a fantastic example of, of why this is important right now, right? With COVID being what it is, we are being thrown massive amounts of numerical information and statistics constantly. You can't watch the news without hearing, you know, how many cases in 100,000 there are right now in British Columbia or all of these various things. And if you have lost the, the skills, I mean, so many people lack the skills to actually understand and do something meaningful with that kind of numerical information. So I don't necessarily think that you need to practice integration by parts every weekend or do an annual checkup to make sure that you still know the chain rule. Um, but I would encourage you to still continue to engage with the types of skills that are emphasized in a mathematics department and when taking mathematics classes like problem solving and I mean, interacting with percentages is a really big one for me because I feel like people really, really struggle with that. Um, and the ways in which you can do that, I encourage, I mean, first of all, just when you engage with numerical information like statistics, like you know, all of the, the information that we're being tossed right now, really consider how you're making meaning of that, okay. 15% or 0.2%, what does that actually mean, right? 0.2%, well, that's two in a thousand. Okay, so that's, you know, and, and go from there and just interact, engage really meaningfully with that. The other one, which is way more fun, is do the sorts of puzzles and games that are actually mathematical, not pretending to be fake mathematical, um, so that you can continue to engage with reasoning, like if, this is happening, then this is happening as a result of that. That sort of thinking is very mathematical in nature and has all sorts of applications through all of life, I would argue. And just as a couple of examples, some of the games that I really like are Ken Ken puzzles. They're fabulous. They range from very, very easy to very, very difficult. They're kind of a extra mathy variation of Sudoku. The other thing that I really love are called logic grid puzzles. And again, they range from really, really simple to very, very rich and complex. Um, and you can find any of those things very easily by Googling them. I'm sure there are also apps and stuff like that. And that will allow you to help you keep your reasoning skills sharp without necessarily focusing on the content of your mathematics courses, because it's true that simply may not be relevant to what you're doing in life. I love that. It's a learning about applying the high level skills rather than focusing on the actual details that you're learning. Uh, Matt, do you have anything um, else to add to that? I think that was a very good um, answer to that question. Uh, maybe what I'll add is, uh, remind me what Calc 2 is. It, like, like, is it, is it? It's integration. Oh, mm -hmm. integral calculus. Okay, thank you. Um, well, to be honest, I think many people are surprised 
at the amount of mathematics that you have to be comfortable with in many professional settings. Um, integration is just one of them. Uh, but I mean, an example that, I mean, I don't have necessarily uh, that much experience in, in um, industry, but uh, my partner is a good example who works for a uh, planetary rover company. They specialize in rover software. And straight out of undergrad, she gets this job and is funneled into, because she did uh, mathematics, was funneled into basically working on machine learning for planetary rover software. In the company, a very small company, there is one other person doing machine learning, but of course is too busy with their own things to actually teach you anything about machine learning. So, and I don't know if anyone's ever looked at machine learning. I haven't really personally, um, but I, I can tell you that it's, it's basically just mathematics. If you go and you look at a textbook of machi machine learning, this is a math textbook. Um, it could be, I don't know, framed differently, but, but fundamentally this is a math topic. And just being comfortable with mathematics and not being afraid of, oh, this is math and I don't have enough math to understand this. Having things like calc, uh, integral calculus calc two in your back pocket is just an extra thing to have uh, to, to feel comfortable and confident trying to teach yourself about machine learning, for example. Love that. Great answer. Thank you so much. So we have a uh, last question, unless uh, you want to add more in the chat. Um, it's a two-parter. Um, so basically, first, the student wants to ask about timing during exams. Five minutes per question for, say, Calc 2 is not enough time. Um, although they know the answer, they don't have time to finish the questions and get very stressed. Do you have um, any suggestions to get better in time management during exams? And then second is, oh, to talk about scaling. So that one, um, I can quickly say it will be dependent on the, uh, for each course instructor. Um, but um, Kaylin and Matt, if you wanna talk about maybe time management for finals, um, answering questions under pressure. Uh, so, so let me just make sure I understand. This is time management, not for, Studying for the exam. For this is time management during, during the, the actual exam. written exam. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hate exams. Again, I'm going to re-emphasize re that. Hate exams, but um, and, and all, I've had the. I would say the the. Uh, I've I've been lucky enough to sort of have like longer timed sort of take home exams, at least during, during COVID um, where time management isn't really a problem. And I know there are a lot of undergrad courses that do that too, but I mean, certainly in my undergrad, all of my exams were timed and definitely going through and reading all the questions ahead of like first thing to do, go through, flip through the whole exam, read the questions because then, I mean, answer the easiest ones first, the ones you know, and then, you know, you don't want to spend the whole time on the first page going, oh, this is like the hardest problem. I don't know how to solve it. You spend the whole time uh, on the exam just thinking about this one problem when the other, I don't know, nine pages of the exam are like things that you can just knock out in 15 minutes and but now you've spent all, all your time just focusing on the one thing that you maybe don't understand or, or need to spend the extra time thinking about. So reading through and then when you're answering the questions that you know that you can do, you're in the background, you're just thinking about strategies for, because immediately you'll, you'll identify, oh, I don't know, immediately know how to solve this question, right? 
And, and so in the background, you're, you're going to be coming up with strategies for, oh, maybe I could do that. Um, I found that to be the, the best way to manage my time training exam. And you, you leave all those, those trickier questions that take the most time uh, for the end that way. I totally agree. That's my tactic too. get knock out the, the quick wins. And then sometimes that gets your, um, you know, sometimes that gets your memory jogging and you sort of like remember how to do the tougher questions later on or the one that you're stuck on. Um, Kaylin, do you have any uh, tips and feedback? Um, I would just add to what you're saying really quickly. Like not only does answering a first few easy ones start to get your mind moving, it also builds your confidence. Mm -hmm. And quite often, you know, getting, losing confidence, losing faith in yourself in the middle of an exam can be absolutely catastrophic for your progress. Because mm -hmm. if you, if your self-talk starts to get really, really negative, um, that can slow you down. That can have a really significant mm -hmm. negative impact on your ability to finish a task that you likely are quite capable of because you've prepared mm -hmm. for this and you've spent all semester preparing for this. So yeah, absolutely. Scan through the exam top to bottom when you first get it and anything that's easy, start there. And if you know, you're reading over a question and you can do the first you know, few lines and then you get stuck, that's fine. Do what you can do and move on and just be willing to continue cycling through the questions of the exam until you've done as much as you can do or until you've run out of time. Um, but exams are not sorted easiest to hardest. Like you don't need to do them in chronological order. It's not necessarily beneficial to do them in order. Um, go through, build your confidence, build mm -hmm. yourself up, right? Know that you can do it. Know that you're cheering yourself on and in creating that environment within yourself, it will help you get through the rest of the exam. Mm -hmm. um, plus you're adding up points, whether you do the first question mm -hmm. or the last question. So like, just keep throwing points mm -hmm. in the pile because that's what you exactly. want to be happening. And um, definitely show your work. Like if you are stuck on that last question, last couple of questions, like show your work and just get part way. Um, definitely don't overshare sh like wrong work, but as long as it's logical, I feel like uh, maybe you can get some part marks in there. I, obviously, once again, it depends on your course instructor and your tutor marker, your TM or TA. But um, I think we have one last question in the chat. And this one was directed to Kaylin. Do you want to read it? Um, yes, I'm so excited. Well, this is a great question. So it says, since you're studying math in the 1500s, how do you find the balance between math versus history? I'm assuming the resources of math back then wouldn't be as abundant as today. Uh, you would be right. So that's the era where they're just gaining access to printing presses. So it's right on the line between handwritten manuscripts and printed books. Um, so <laughs> way fewer resources, if you can even find a copy of the book you're looking for. Um, so in terms of emphasis, if I'm not answering, you know, if I'm misunderstanding you, just let me know. But in terms of my course plan, right, I'm in the mathematics department, I'm studying mathematics, all of the courses that I'm taking for credit towards my degree are in mathematics. So none of them are in history specifically. When uh, people study the history of mathematics, they tend to come in one of two directions. So either they start in mathematics and loving mathematics and move towards having an interest in history, or they start loving history and then become interested in the history of science and move towards science and mathematics. So you can go from the humanities towards math and science or from math and science towards the humanities. Myself, I'm a math girl at heart and I'm edging towards the historical stuff. So in terms of the balance of my courses, my courses are heavily mathematical. Um, I did take a reading course with my supervisor and another professor from another university that's on my supervisory committee on the history of mathematics just this past semester. And that of course was heavily historical, but it was like very much the history of math and the history of science. And we got to read about Euclid and Regimontanus and Copernicus and all those cool people. Um, so in terms of, in terms of the balance, my balance is very heavily tipped towards the mathematical side. Um, in terms of how, uh, do you say, I'm assuming the resources of math back then wouldn't be as abundant as today. No, 
a lot of it's written in Latin. So some of my studies is also going to be linguistic. I have to learn to read a new language um, within the course of the next six months or so, so that I can actually write my thesis. Um, but yeah, definitely less resources, but such an important and interesting and rich topic. I totally recommend taking uh, Dr. Archibald's History of Math course if you can. It's absolutely fascinating. Definitely a Very cool guy. <laughs> um, it sounds cool. Like I want to go back to school. <laughs> it's fun. It's really fun. I mean, math history was one of the one of the, my favorite courses I took in undergrad. So really, wow. history of yeah. math. Yeah, at Queens. It was in my last it was in the, my very last term <laughs> and it was the only time it ever ran there and i was very happy that i, I was able to to uh, enroll in that class that's it's awesome. fantastic yeah it's a lot of fun thanks for wow. asking thank you so much um matt and kaylin for joining us for this mini um q a discussion panel that we have and thank you so much for the wonderful students that attended today um i hope Hope this was insightful. Um, and I'm sure like if you have any questions, you could obviously reach out to me. And um, and I'm sure Kaylin and Matt would be happy to um, facilitate any other questions, especially any Definitely. historical math <laughs> or any like other graduate um, studies, their paths and stories. Um, but it's been a, a great conversation with everyone. So thank you all for um, attending. And I hope um the next session will just be as um eventful yeah thank you thanks Bye. for organizing it thank you